Hello again and welcome back to Right Man in the Wrong Place. My name is Luke Tatum and I react to music. Today, we are going to be listening to some more Opeth. We've got on the docket The Devil's Orchard from the 2011 album Heritage. This is another donation request through the Buy Me a Coffee link, which you will find over here. And it's a donation request from good friend of the channel, Daniel, a.k.a. Seif, on YouTube here. Uh, he has been making several different donation requests, and I super, super appreciate that. That's part of how we have this nice light over on this side of me now to help balance the lighting in the shot. Uh, I think it adds a lot to it, so that's pretty awesome. And this is, I think, the first time I'm hearing anything from this Opeth album. So, you know, new territory, that's always exciting. Heard a lot of Opeth at this point, but I know there's, you know, way, way more that I haven't heard than that I have heard. So I do have to say the album art, which you should already see up here, uh, is very peculiar, very interesting. Um, I don't want to necessarily venture what that all might be representing without, well, without getting into it and hearing some of the music. So without further ado, let's get into this. I am ready. Opeth, The Devil's Orchard. This almost uh, this almost sounds like a completely different band. Um, it's a little bit of like King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard type, uh, King Crimson maybe. Uh, this is really, really different. I'm gonna start that over. really nice textures here uh the the riff kind of the main riff here if you want to call it the melody um it's kind of got this off kilter kind of uneven feel to it you know it's like it it picks up in a weird place it it's not you know it's not like a, a nice rigid like eighth note pattern or something it's kind of a uh, more of a jazzy, like loosely interpreted version of something else. You know, it's it's, it's uh, lo liquid. It's kind of a liquid riff, and I love it. I love it. it. Sounds really nice. I do, of course, have to speak on the lyrics here, right? So we've had this not a whole lot of of sung lyrics so far, but I did hear and read here. Take the road where devils speak. God is dead. God is dead. 
if you're not a into philosophy and all those things and you haven't read you know books by philosophers you may not know that god is dead is you know a famous quote from frederick nietzsche i will hold on just a second i'm gonna pull it up okay i'm back i pulled it up the quote the full quote from frederick nietzsche um a lot of times you will just see God is dead in quotations. And there's, you know, people will run with that in all kinds of different ways to justify some philosophical point or religious point that they want to make for some specific reason. Uh, and it's very rare that you will see even any additional words from the original context. Uh, but I'm going to read the full quotation. If you don't want to see that, just skip ahead a little bit. Uh, doesn't hurt my feelings. We'll get back to the song. But Nietzsche said, God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festival of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? It, is it not the greatness of this deed? Uh, excuse me. Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? And so, what does that mean? Well... I don't know that it necessarily belongs all in this reaction video, but, you know, briefly, very briefly, it's this secularism that became more prevalent in Nietzsche's time, you know, and, and certainly as we entered into the 21st century and all those things, um, this secularism, this rela relationship with science as kind of a replacement for religion, for spirituality, for open-ended philosophical questions. It's just, you know, well, if it's not on a, under a microscope, then it must not be real. And it's a, it's a condemnation of all things that do not have an immediate, reasonable explanation that is, is met with, uh, that, that's easily met by existing tools and existing modes of inquiry, right? So, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, Frank Herbert has a wonderful quote. I won't. I won't pause and pull up another quote. But you know, it's effectively that the the human brain always yearns for a logical world that makes sense, but the real world is always one step beyond logic. It's pretty close to the original quote. And you know, Frank uh, Dune, Frank Herbert's novels. You know, of course, they're very like. There's a lot of mysticism and that kind of stuff in there, religious commentary and all those things. But, you know, Nietzsche had his particular view on things and, and others, you know, Carl Jung and others had their particular views on things. But you, the thing that you have to know, if you want to just say, okay, from a purely scientific standpoint, what can we perceive? What do we understand, etc.? We know nothing. Humans know nothing, right? There's things that you know, there's things that you don't know, and then there's things that you don't know that you don't know. And that last category is of infinite size. We have not the faintest clue as human beings what we don't know. We don't know. And we really don't have the means to figure it out, right? You think of the, the range of visible light as a good example, I'm not the first person to make this point by any means, but you know, we can see specific wavelengths of light. You have infrared, you know, which is a little bit above and, and all those, but almost all wavelengths of light we can't see. We need specialized tools. We have to figure out how to configure them. We have to interpret these things that we detect using these other tools. There's, you know, entire realities that we can't even see. And this elimination of 
any room in human life for spiritual thought, whether you're religious or not, doesn't matter for the purposes of this video. This elimination of all spiritual thought and this, this confining everything into the, the realm of what we currently understand, which is nothing, removes our ability to inquire into even larger questions, right? And it removes our, our human creativity, the thing, one of the things that makes us human, from the equation. You know, we don't even understand what consciousness is. And yet here I am talking about it. I'm sorry, this is a very long <laughs> sidebar. Okay, let's listen to some good music. You all want to listen to music? I think that's what we're here for, isn't it? Yeah, get back in the group. Okay, I, I was really into that for a second. Because I love it. Think about how the drummer is playing here. You know, you've got him riding on, on a cymbal, just some light taps on a couple of cymbals, it sounds like. And he's got his his snare hand just kind of on the snare. You know, it feels like, okay, he's playing a couple of cymbals. He comes back and just does like a little five-stroke roll or something, or even a three-stroke roll. And just, it's very like way, way, way toned down, pulled back. It's very nice, very uh artfully done right it's just it's 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 a groove it's creating space from the intensity that we just departed this is not i mean it's certainly not the heaviest opaz song but you know you've got these these segments always where you've got some some heavier stuff you've got some lighter stuff and you know it's very delicate this is which is right mean, it's great. It's great. What is that? Mixing wise, it's way over on the right. There's some interesting percussion work happening over here, and I don't know what it is. Bass really fills in the spaces whenever you've got the the percussion, the guitars, you know, kind of like ending on a note together and kind of giving getting some space. That space is filled by a lovely little bass interlude, you know, boo -doo -doo -boo -boo kind of a thing, and it's it's very tasty, <laughs> very tasty. Let's catch that again. There's a really interesting kind of transition, like a really cool bridge here. Back it up a little more.
swear I make Boston comparisons a lot when I listen to Opeth, which is something I never thought I'd say in my life, but it's very Boston. I was about to comment on that nice solo and then they really know how to leave you hanging sometimes on these, you know, cause that could have easily explored another two or three or four minutes, right? A solo, maybe a second solo, maybe pull back into some of the previous stuff. Like the, sometimes their endings are so jarring. Um, lyrics wise, particularly interested in this last um, four line segment here. So lead, uh, led the blind in search to find a pathway to the sun saw the signs intertwine and forgave me all my sins. That could obviously mean a lot of different things, but I think in the context of the God is dead, Nietzsche, obviously, obviously a Nietzsche callback, it, it, it's almost gotta be. I'm on Lyrics Genius. I don't know how it's printed, you know, in the album itself, in the little booklet, but in on the lyrics that I'm reading on genius.com, well, every time it says God is dead, it's in quotations, right? So that leads me to believe that that is meant to be quoting someone. And if you're quoting someone and saying that, you're quoting Nietzsche. So this, this section that I just read about leading the blind, I believe that you could read this as led the blind in search to find a pathway to the sun. In other words, leading the public, the uninformed, ignorant public, to find a pathway to enlightenment, right? The sun is a very common metaphor for the divine. Uh, you know, there's obviously been historically sun worship and that kind of thing. Um, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of overlap in sun imagery and God imagery, okay? But this pathway to the sun would be a pathway to enlightenment for the public, but then saw the signs intertwine and forgave me all my sins. I think you could read that as an intertwining of the purely secular, non-spiritual with some of the same imagery, practices, uh, routines of religious iconography, religious practice, and then with those things twining together, you kind of have science becoming religion. It is a religion in a certain sense. I know some people will not be happy with me saying that. It's fine. And then, you know, <laughs> can science absolve you of your sins, right? Well, do you even feel like you need absolution, right? There's 
It's a lot to say. And then, of course, it closes out with no stigmas revealing our vices, and there are no stigmas revealing our vices. So it repeats that twice. And I think that's saying the same thing. I think it's saying the stigmas of, you know, religious dogma, religious practice, you know, they provide a standard of right and wrong. And I am not saying and will not say ever that religion is a requirement, requirement, I can't talk, requirement, not saying it's a requirement to have morality. I am not saying that. But it does serve as a reinforcement of right and wrong. Like there is a standard, whether you agree with it or not, that kind of doesn't matter for this purpose. I'm just saying there is a standard. It's laid out. It's codified. It's in a religious text, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's like, well, you're violating this this code of of prac of a uh, uh, behavior, and if you're not violating that, then you know you're free of a stigma. And so, so science doesn't really have that, right? You have you have all this. Uh, <laughs> this kind of a looser interpretation of things, which you think of science as being very, you know, black and white, but there's like, I mean, have you ever looked at any religious studies on like any sociological topic? It's like studies show that, you know, people are happier under this type of government. People, you know, studies show this, studies show that. And you can find studies that contradict each other left and right all the time. It's very easy. And so it becomes a completely gray area if your only guiding principle is science. If you replace spirituality, religion, whatever variety of that you are into with purely, purely science. Uh, science is extremely easy to manipulate for political gain, etc., etc. So I think I've probably said enough on that. And here I thought this was a short song. I'd do a short reaction, but uh, <laughs> oh well. Really cool, very interesting. I obviously got a lot more out of this than I expected to. Fun, fun, fun. Really nice. I, uh, and I do have to say, I can't say enough about the drumming. The drumming is very varied in this song. Really nice, really nice textures in there. Daniel, Seif, I'm not sure which one you'd prefer me to say. I'll just say both, I guess, unless I hear otherwise. But Really, really appreciate the donation request. This was an interesting song. It's an interesting album, obviously. The imagery on the cover, it's all, it's very, very interesting. So up for more of that. Someday soon, I'm going to do the entire Still Life album. Uh, once I catch up on reactions that are requested, that are paid donations, then I think I'll start exploring that and mixing in other stuff. So here's to more Opeth. Always enjoy these. Thank you all so much for being here, especially when I get all rambly like this. I just go where it takes me, you know. Um, until next time, the right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. I'll see you then.